most of the time when you're given used oil analysis limits, the numbers just kind of turn up. Uh, maybe the OEM is the one that has set the limits. So, you know, I do a lot of work with Yen Barker gas engines, for example, and the limit for iron is often set at something like 20 parts per million or silicon will be set at 200 parts per million. So the OEM has specified what the limit is and what is acceptable. Then in some instances, you might have like industry standard limits. So again, with gas engines, something that we might say is that the TBN is allowed to take go from its original value down to half of its original value. So that's also dependent on the formulation. So the higher the TBN, then in some ways, the more it can fall. In some instances, the limits seem a little bit arbitrary. Maybe you just get a report that's returned to you and it has, you know, a, a, a red box around iron. The number is 25 you don't entirely know why that limit is there. So now let's try to explain what happens when the OEM hasn't defined a limit and what is the process that a lab would go through in order to define limits for an application. Now, if you remember, I've talked in the past about the idea of proactive, predictive, as well as reactive maintenance. And when we're doing oil analysis, we're trying to intervene at the proactive or the predictive stage. So for example, with proactive, we're trying to eliminate some of the root causes of machine failure. Some of the root causes, for example, might include contamination. So if we can measure the amount of contamination that is in our oil system, then we can intervene we can clean up that contamination and we can prevent the failure from happening in the first place. So that's an example of something that's in the proactive domain. Something that's in the predictive domain might be something like wear information, right? So what we're showing is a degradation in performance. So if it shows up in iron or PQ or in the case of engines, maybe aluminium, then in that case, what we're showing is that there is ongoing wear and how bad is that? At what point do we want to intervene? Do we want to change the oil? That enables us to act in that sort of predictive domain. So let's start by talking about what we might call proactive alarms. Now, these are what we might call goal-based limits, right? So an example that I gave was contamination. That is an example of a proactive measure that we're trying to take is contamination control. So here, what we might show is that as contamination goes down, the mean time between failures goes down. Now, obviously, there is an economic limit that you approach. So as we start to clean up our oil, we're getting a lot of bang for buck. But at some point, the amount of money that you have to spend to clean beyond, let's say, arbitrarily, a, a sort of an ISO 1311, maybe it becomes so expensive that it's not worth it. So there is some point at which you're going to say, uh, this is my target and this is what I'm aiming for. And this is kind of what we would call a goal-based limit. Now, another example of proactive limits might be those which are age-based. So this is talking about the actual condition of the oil. So we might wanna get out in front of that. So as an example, something like oxidation. Oxidation will increase over time, but additives will deplete over time. So they are an example of something that would see uh, a pattern that's a little bit more similar to that blue curve. And we might be able to define some limits. Maybe we have a number of different limits whether that's on additive depletion, oxidation, total acid number, total base number. And when we reach one of those limits, that's when we define, okay, we, we need to change the oil. Now we also have predictive alarms, right? Going back to our model, we're talking about things like wear metals. So let's think about a little bit more deeply about predictive alarms. So in some cases, we have what we call rate of change limits. And here's why that's really important. Now, when we look on an axis where we're measuring wear particles and time, and I'm saying wear particles in a generic sense because it could be the PQ index, it could be the ISO particle count, it could be iron or aluminium as ICP. There's a whole bunch of different things that could go into this. It is non-trivial to say that uh, the position on the right is showing a condition of wear which is worse than the circle on the left, right? And that makes sense. As we increase in the number of hours, it's most likely that our wear increases. However, what about this instance, right? The number of wear particles is higher in the position on the right, but the rate of change is less. And wear is a process that occurs over time. So that would suggest that the wear rate has actually decreased over time. And so that's actually a positive indicator. So when we're talking about rate of change limits, remember we are talking about the, if you like, derivative of the curve. Sorry to take you back to high school calculus, but what we're talking about is that sort of tangential line. 
Um, if we want to calculate the rate of change, what we do is we take the rise and we divide it by the run. And if you ever have uh, a little bit of trouble remembering whether it's rise over run or run over rise, probably the easiest way to do it is to actually use the units. So in this case, we're doing the rise is measured in parts per million of wear particles and the run is measured in time or hours, right? And so that gives us a rate of change of wear particles per million divided by hours. So that gives us a rate of change limit. Now, another example where rate of change limits can be extremely important is what if I took something like this, like this scenario? Well, we, clearly you can see that the rate of change was high at the very beginning. So maybe that's indicative of something like running in wear. Then it's stabilized. And then right towards the end, we have an uh, uh, a time of increased wear rate. Now, even though the absolute limit for iron is set quite high, you could argue that you should potentially be concerned on the left-hand side of the curve. So we would potentially say that we have normal wear, normal wear, I'd say, in inverted commas in the middle, and we have accelerated or abnormal wear both in the beginning and the end of this particular cycle. And it would be important to look into the reasons for that. So for example, in an engine, if it were running in wear at the very beginning, that's a perfectly normal process and we expect that to slow down over time. On the other hand, if it wasn't running in wear, that could be indicative of an issue that we need to address. And so that's an example of using oil analysis to be able to guide predictive maintenance. Now, in this instance, we've brought the absolute limit down. And in fact, what you can see is that even though it is experiencing a normal wear rate, we are exceeding the absolute limit. So again, that's kind of contradictory, right? Maybe what you would argue at that point is, well, we've We've gone through a period of abnormal wear. We've rectified that. We're now seeing a normal wear pattern. And even though it has exceeded maybe the OEM absolute limit, we are comfortable with the rate of wear and we're actually going to continue uh, with this current oil drain. Now, in the absence of all these limits, you can also apply some statistical reasoning if you want to develop limits yourself. So how can, how can these be developed? Let's say, for example, uh, again, I'm going to use an engine because it's very repeatable, but it could be, you know, a gearbox. Let's say we, and we take an oil drain and we start from zero hours and we work our way up to some arbitrary number of hours. Maybe it's a uh, thousand, just make it a nice even round number. And let's say that the result at a thousand hours, I have a bit of a spread in, in the values, right? So anywhere between 34 and 68 parts per million of, for argument's sake, let's say it's iron. Well, if we were to plot these, right? Uh, and I'm going to map these onto a different sort of space where the wear um, is now going to be on the x-axis, we could start to count them. Now, in a sample set of six, that's not really enough data to tell us what is normal and what is abnormal. So what we need is we need more data. And so you need to overlay uh, more kind of uh, uh, oil runs. So for more examples of zero to a thousand hours. And if you continue to do this over time, what you're going to develop is a kind of spread of results. And typically the more results you get um, per, you know, the central limit theorem, you'll start to see it approach a normal distribution. And we typically say that in order to apply the normal distribution to a set of data, you probably need about 30 data points, right? So eventually it will start to look like the normal distribution and now we can start to set limits. So often what we'll say is um, anywhere between one standard deviation from the average or the mean, we'll call those normal results. Anything that's beyond that becomes um, a caution. Anything that is two standard devi de deviations beyond the mean becomes an alarm. Right? So that's a way that we can apply these. Now, one thing that you should note is that as we change our position on this line, right, the distribution is also going to change. So typically, right, let's say, for example, fresh oils are all typically going to be clustered around zero parts per million, right? So there's very little spread. And, and the spread in results should probably get larger as the number of hours increases. So here around the 500 hour mark, what we're showing is that that spread is a lot smaller than it was at a thousand hours. And so that is actually going to tighten up the limits at 500 hours of what is normal. So that's an example of how you can use historical data to develop limits for yourself. Now, keep in mind 
right? That these lines where I'm showing where over time, they need to be comparable data. So it, for example, it needs to be the same engine running on the same fuel, right? It's gotta be a, a like for like comparison. You can't have, um, let's say for example, a gas engine being compared to a diesel engine or a, or a Cummins being compared to, um, let's say a Daimler or, you know, Caterpillar engine or something like that. It You need to have an apples for apples comparison. And then this is why, the oil analysis laboratories are really the ones who are able to set these kind of limits because they have huge, huge data sets where they're taking on so many thousands and thousands of samples from a variety of different customers. They're able to build up these huge databases. Um, as an individual, you're unlikely to be able to do that unless you have a very, very large fleet. So there are some like truck fleets, for example, or in the mining industry, sometimes you'll see large um, kind of like excavative fleets and um, big truck fleets as well. Um, you know, the type like big loaders, uh, for example, you know, the, the Cat 777 types. Uh, maybe if you have enough of those, you can start to build up uh, enough of a database that you can get an idea of what is normal versus what is abnormal.